Well, today I believe that God has a very important message for each one of us. And if you're here, you're regular tender, or you're, you're here for the first time, or you're checking us out on YouTube, I just want to pray real quick that, that our ears would be open, our hearts would be, would be made a, alive through the hearing of the Word of God this morning. So would you join me in a, in a prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, look to your Word. We thank you so much, God. For what this day means, we thank you, Lord, that you are also our soon coming king. And we pray today, God, that you would open our minds, open our hearts to receive your word and let it change us and let us leave different than the way we came in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, since today is Palm Sunday, I was thinking about Jesus's ride his triumphant entrance into the city of Jerusalem on that donkey. I mean, it was a moment of triumph. It was a moment of glory for sure. The crowd was all around praising him, waving the palm branches, and just shouting things like, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He, he rode in as a fulfillment to a prophetic message given by the prophet Zechariah about 520 years prior. And it says this in Zechariah 9, 9. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I mean, what a ride. He did this to fulfill prophecy. That was given over 500 years ago. And if it was me, I probably wouldn't have chosen a donkey, okay? I would have chosen like a Cadillac Escalade, okay? <laughs> or maybe a uh, Hummer, okay? Or maybe a, more, a four-wheel drive Jeep of some kind. I mean, I would have cho- what about this? I would have chosen maybe Marine One to like helicopter me in or something like that where I could jump out of the of the. Uh, the, the I don't know what they do. The Marines, they jump out this little rope that they kind of rappel down. You know, I would have done something like that. But, but Jesus had something else in mind. Our righteous king rode into Jerusalem on a humble donkey, which is a symbol of peace. He, he rode as a savior, as a humble servant king sent to redeem fallen man. He rode into the city to begin his his final week-long passion, his week-long suffering on the way to the cross in order to lay down his life for sinful man as a ransom for us. This is why he did it. He had a hero's welcome into the city, but he died a brutal criminal's death. And this was all in accordance with, with the will of God. And here's what I want us to think about this morning as we look to the word in just a second. As, as important and as essential as, as that ride was, it makes me think of another ride that's going to come. It makes me think of the promise of hope that we have. It makes me think of a future glorious event that is still yet to come, and it makes me eagerly anticipate. And this is what I want to talk to you about for just a few minutes. Jesus is going to ride again. I want you to think about that with me. He is going to ride again. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever considered that? Have you ever studied that in the Holy Scripture? Is it, is it in the forefront of your mind? Like, do you live your life thinking, wow, my, God, my Jesus, my Lord and my Savior, he rode the first time, but he will ride again. And he is going to come back. Like, do you live that way? Is it in the forefront of your thinking? Because if it is, it changes everything. Because Jesus' next ride is going to be very different than his first. Jesus' next ride is going, to be for, is going to look different, it's going to feel different, and it's going to be for a much different purpose than his first. When he rides again, we will all be affected. 
When he rides again, the whole world will be affected. When he rides again, everything is going to change. Did you know this morning, I just want to encourage you, Jesus is going to ride again. He's going to ride again. Let's look at it in the scripture because uh, looking into the future, John on the island of Patmos saw an amazingly descriptive scene of Jesus' next ride. And we understand it as the second coming of Jesus Christ to the earth. So if you have your Bibles, it's going to be up on the screen as well. If you're taking notes, jot this down. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 19 for just a few minutes. And John said this. Are you ready? This is amazing. John said, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. You see, when Jesus comes again, he's not on a humble donkey riding into the city of Jerusalem. Rather, this time when he comes, he'll be riding on a white horse. And riding a white horse speaks of honor. It speaks of power. It speaks of speed. And the color of this horse speaks of righteousness and victory. The rider of this horse of this horse, his name is called Faithful and True. Will you say that with me? His name is called Faithful and True. This glorious title shows that Jesus is the keeper of his promises, including his promises for judgment. We're going to talk about that just a little bit later. But how many of you know that God is just? He is faithful. It goes on to say in Revelation 19, with justice, he judges and wages war. You see, when Jesus rides again, he comes as a judge, as a general to make war. The unbelieving world that rejected him before rejects him again, rejects him again. But this time, Jesus is bringing judgment. Verse 12 says his, his eyes, think about this scene right here. His eyes are like blazing fire. And his head, uh, on his head are many, many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And I was thinking about those eyes of fire. Have you ever known somebody who just had like eyes that were piercing, that can look at you and it's almost like they're not looking at you, they're looking at your, at your soul. I mean, they could see past all the surface stuff, they could see past all the facades and the masks that you may put on, but they could see into your soul. This is Jesus. This is his eyes of fire. I was reading about this and and uh, Charles Spurgeon, an old preacher, he commented on this, and he said, he ha Jesus has flames of fire for his eyes because he discerns the secrets of our hearts. There are no secrets here that Christ does not see. There's no lewd thought. There's no unbelieving skepticism that Christ does not read. There is no hypocrisy, no formalism, no deceit that he does not scan as easily as a man reads a page in a book. His eyes are like flames of fire to read us through and through and to know us in our innermost soul. He has eyes like fire. On his head... There are many crowns. You know, the last time Jesus, the last time uh, the earth saw Jesus, he wore a crown, but it was made out of what? Thorns. But not anymore. In the future, he's going to wear many crowns. And I looked up that word for crowns, and it's, and it's diemma. Diemma is the crown, crowns of royalty, crowns of authority. And the fact that there are many crowns that he's wearing symbolizes that Jesus 
is the ultimate in royal authority and royal power. It is a visible manifestation of what it means when we say Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. It is an expression of unlimited sovereignty, supreme power, supreme authority. Are you getting this picture? This is amazing because Jesus is going to ride again. Think about this with me in verse 13. It says, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood or sprinkled in blood, and his name is the word of God. I was trying to figure out what this blood is, and it, could have, it doesn't say it clearly, but, it's, but uh, what I read was this could have been his own blood reminding us of the victory of the cross, or it could have been the blood of his enemies during this time of judgment and war. Either one is quite possible. Verse 14, it says this, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Jesus is not riding alone. He is riding with the people of God, the armies of heaven. These are God's people, and these are the angels of God, no doubt. The book of Jude confirms this. If you look at Jude chapter, uh, well, there's only one chapter in Jude, but verse 14 and 15, it says this, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So when he comes, it's for a different purpose this time. When he comes, it's to execute judgment this time. And do you think he's excited about that? No, I don't think so. Why do you think the Lord is patient in his coming? Because his heart is not to have to judge and condemn, but his heart is that everyone would know the gospel and that everyone would hear and respond and obey the gospel and receive salvation. So I believe when he's coming and he's executing this judgment, he's not doing it with a smile on his face. He wants all people to repent and to receive salvation. Revelation 19, back in uh, 19, verse 15, it says this. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And this idea is, it's, it's not like a, a buccaneer with a, with a sword in his mouth or like he's spitting swords or something. But it's a dramatic way just to communicate there is power in his words. There, Christ conquers by the power of his word. He conquers through the power of his word. Five times, I looked it up in the book of Revelation, John emphasizes that Jesus' sword comes out of his mouth. Christ conquers by the power of his, rule, of his word. Verse 15 says this, he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the wine press, wine press of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. In other words, Jesus comes to rule. He comes to reign in triumph, the, to rule the nations with a r- rod of iron. This was predicted even back in Psalm number 2. It says this in Psalm 2, verse 9, you will rule over them with a rod, with an iron rod. You will break them into pieces like pottery. Revelation 19, verse 16. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. 
You see, he comes again as king of kings and lord of lords. And he comes to displace every king, every president, every prime minister, every leader that is reigning on this earth at that time. Jesus will ride again and replace them as king of kings and lord of lords to bring victory, to bring judgment, to bring the fullness of the kingdom of God. This is something to look forward to. This is our hope as Christian believers. I know many churches don't talk about it because it can be a lot of a kind of scary, right, to think about Jesus is coming back and what is that going to look like? But my friends, don't be scared. You have a hope. Grab hold of that future hope because when you know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ will ride again, it should bring you encouragement to live for today. Yeah. The next time that Jesus rides, things will be quite different. He will no longer come riding on a humble donkey, right? This time he will come in the clouds with power and great glory as the king of kings and the lord of lords. And not just like on a Palm Sunday where he's king for a day. But no, he will be king for all time and king of eternity. He'll be riding on a white horse. His eyes are going to be like fire. A mighty sword coming from his mouth. A crown on his head and, the, and, and he's coming to rule and to reign. My friends, that should be good news. And here's what I want you to hear about this today. Just as the words of prophecy predicted Jesus' first ride on that donkey into Jerusalem, the words of prophecy have also predicted his glorious second ride. It's a sure thing. And as New Testament believers, we should look forward to this wonderfully anticipated, glorious event. I love how John Eldridge said it in his book called All Things New. It's up on the screen. I want to read it to you. It says this, the great hope and expectation of the Christian faith is focused on one dramatic Startling event, sudden as a bolt of lightning, sharp as the tip of a sword, the bodily return of Jesus Christ, and with that, the renewal of all things. As we study the Bible together, we see that when Jesus returns, he ushers in the fullness of the kingdom of God. When Jesus returns, all the powers of hell will be ultimately defeated. The people of God will receive their full inheritance and reward, for we will put on immortality when Jesus comes. The heavens and the earth will be made new. In fact, heaven will come down to the earth, and God will make his dwelling with his people forever and ever God's people will rule and will reign with him until, the, until eternity. Have you ever considered this? Have you ever really thought about it? Have you ever dove into the scriptures and studied it for yourself? Is this the way that you envision your future? If it's not, and you're a Christian, it should be. This is why the writers of the New Testament would say things like this. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul said, we are eagerly awaiting for him to, what? Return. In 1 Corinthians, Paul again says, we eagerly await, await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be, what? Revealed. 2 Peter Peter says this, we are eagerly looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Again in Peter, it says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. The New Testament believers 
thought about the second coming of Jesus Christ, and this is where their hope lied. They were eagerly awaiting for Jesus Christ to be revealed. Are you and am I eagerly awaiting? They thought that Jesus Christ should return, could return any moment, and they were right to do so. All throughout the, the decades, the centuries, the New Testament, believers thought Jesus Christ should return at any moment to usher in the fullness of the kingdom of God, and they were right to do so. Many of us. Me about, some people have mocked Christians and said, well, where is Jesus? Wasn't, isn't he coming back? I thought, I thought you, but you guys have been saying this for 2,000 years. Where is he? But you and I are right to believe that he will come back soon. The New Testament believers believed it. We should believe it is, well, Jesus Christ, my brothers and sisters, will ride again. <clears throat> okay, so I'm a believer. I believe that Jesus Christ is coming in God's time. I believe that. But what should I do? What should I be doing in the meantime? Now, let me get practical with you because uh, the Bible answers that question. Okay, I believe it. Now tell me what I should be doing. So what? Give me some practical application about this truth. Let's look together at 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Peter says, the end of all things is near. The end of all things, the culmination, the wrap-up of all things is near. Peter believed that, and he said that, and he, and he says, therefore, here's what you should do. Be clear-minded. In other words, think straight. Make sure your thinking is, is correct and aligned with the word of God. Don't let your thinking be confused and clouded by the things that the enemy may tell you or the things that this culture may try to get you belie to believe. But make sure your thinking is aligned with God's word and only the truth of his word. So he says, therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled. Why? So that you can pray. Do I have any prayer warriors in the house? Okay. So that you can pray. If you don't know how to pray, get around somebody who knows how to pray. If you don't know how to pray, ask the Lord. Lord, teach me to pray. And study the scriptures and ask your pastor and ask your leaders and figure out how you can grow in your prayer life. So number one, jot this down, devote yourself to prayer. Devote yourself to prayer. I just want to deputize everybody in here and just be like, no, if you, if you want to obey this, if you want to do this, I want to deputize you to just be on the prayer team right now. All right, we've got a prayer team, but it's not big enough. It needs to be bigger. It needs to include you. It needs to include everybody who's watching by way of YouTube. We need to all be on the prayer team. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Especially with next weekend coming up. Yeah. Easter Sunday. What More people go to church on Easter Sunday who, who never go to church before. It's such, a, it's such a wonderful opportunity for people to hear the gospel. When I was growing up, I was a creaster, right? I went to church on Christmas and Easter, all right? I don't know if anybody ever grew up like that, but I did. And I appreciated when I went to church on Easter, the pastor and the church were ready for me. And they had been praying for me. To hear the word of God, to respond to the word of God. They were prepared. They were spiritually prepared to share the gospel with people who may not have ever heard it before. But because it was Easter, they said yes to an invitation. And they went and they joined their friends, their family at a particular church. And so what I want to encourage everyone to do right now is to join the prayer team, especially for this week. Okay, now let me give you what you say. Well, okay, well, I'll join the prayer team. What does that mean? What, do you, what should I pray for? Okay, I'm glad you asked. 
Jot this down if you're taking notes, okay? I'm going to give you some prayer points. I'm serious, some prayer points for this particular week. I want you to pray these things. Number one, pray that everyone feels welcomed. Pray against distractions and for people to be receptive to the message. I love Easter because it's wonderful, and trust me, I'm going to bring a message that, that people will understand about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the victory and the hope that we have in him. And wouldn't it be amazing if somebody responded next week and raised their hand and said, yeah, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and they did so because you and I prayed them in. We prayed them in. Number two, pray for all spirits, all evil spirits of fear, guilt, shame, condemnation, and rejection would be bound in Jesus' name. In other words, fight some spiritual warfare against the enemy who would want to come in and confuse and, and come in and blind their eyes. We need to pray against the work of the enemy. Not only that, we need to pray that people connect with God and experience his presence. We need to pray that people shift their focus to the Lord and away from their problems. Man, I'd just like to encourage one, one second, one millisecond in the presence of God can change a person's life. When the, when the light bulb goes on, for just a minute pe period of time, it can absolutely change somebody's heart, change somebody's mind, and it happens as a result of our prayers. Come on, church. Let's be a praying church. Let's be a praying church. Next is let's pray for people to experience life and clarity. Let's pray for the lost to be drawn to God and to commit their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. That's what this church is all about. That's what our Sunday mornings are all about. We want to help people know God. We want to help people know God. To know God is to know eternal life. To know God is to know freedom. To know God is to know our purpose. To know God is to make a difference in our community, and in the lives of other people. This is what our church is all about. Will you join me in praying that people would come to know the hope of Jesus Christ? And not only that, let's pray for, for people's willingness to take next steps. Boy, that's what I always encourage people to do. What's your next step? Let's take it. Is your next step to... to, to Receive salvation? Let's do that together. What's your next step? Is it to be baptized? Is your next step to, to go through the growth track and get plugged in to the local church? Is your next step to begin serving somewhere? What is your next step? I'm going to be asking people that question next week. And I want you to be praying with me that people will have hearts that are willing to say, Yes, Lord, whatever my next step is, I will obey you. So number one, I will devote myself to prayer. Will you devote yourself to prayer? First Peter, chapter four, verses eight and nine, says, goes on to say this: Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Number two is I should focus on relationships. Make church attendance a non-negotiable for you, for your family. Make the effort to connect with others. In other words, take the initiative. Sometimes we have to step out of our comfort zone and introduce ourselves or come to a life group or get out there. Take the initiative and don't wait on the pastor to ask you to do something or to, or to go this. No, no, you take the first step. 
Let me just put the ball in your court right now. You want to get plugged in? You want to focus on building healthy relationships? Then you show up at the events. You show up at the growth track. You show up at the life group. You make church attendance a priority. You have to take the initiative. All right, two people enjoyed that right there. I should focus on relationships. We need the support from each other. We need the love. We need the prayers. We need the, we need the get-togethers, right? We need to do life togethers. Uh, we need that in our lives. So it goes on to say in First Peter, remember, this is all in the context of the end is near. What should we do? We should, we should pray. What should we do? We should focus on relationships. Now, let's continue reading. Verse, uh, ver- First Peter, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks... He should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. And that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So number three is this. We should make a difference. We should be people of prayer, we should focus on relationships, and we should set our hearts to make a difference by serving other people. We are here on purpose, for a purpose. In other words, we all have a job. We all have an assignment. We all have been given a God-given mission to fulfill. And the question that we have to wrestle with is this, am I intentionally serving? Am I finding a need and meeting the need? Am I looking around me? Am I looking beyond myself? And I'm seeing the needs of other people. I'm seeing the needs of the church. I'm seeing the needs of the community because the Lord is opening my eyes. I see a need and I feel a need and I commit myself, I commit my heart to make a difference and serve other people in the name of the Lord Jesus. Are you intentionally serving somewhere? Are you using your gifts? Are you a part of a team? Well, you can be and you should be. I want to go ahead and invite the worship team up. It helps me kind of close. (laughs) Because if you can't tell, I'm passionate about this. (laughs) And I want to see the church of Jesus Christ just be be propelled by the power of the Holy Spirit into into our destiny, into making a difference in our community. And I want to see God's word work in us. And I want to see the gospel be spread and for people to respond, especially on Easter. This is the prayer of my heart. Why? Because the time is short. And I say that with all honesty, with all, with all humility. Our time is short and the days are evil. The word of God says make every opportunity count. Make every opportunity count. I adopted a... Um, declaration this week that I'm going to be praying and declaring over over myself and over each one of you on a regular basis and I just want to declare that over you now because there's a lot at stake
there's a lot at stake. People need to know God. And we, his church, are his plan, are his vehicle, are his way, his method, that his word gets out to the world. We are his plan. The Lord needs us. He needs us to carry his word. He needs us to be faithful and true. He needs us to be close to him. He needs us to be people of prayer and people committed to one another and people who set their hearts to making a difference. And here's my declaration. The time is short. My king is coming soon. Because eternity matters, I will give him my all. No regrets, no excuses, holding absolutely nothing back. With his help and by his power, I will leave no word unsaid, no deed undone, and no hope unshared. My faith moves mountains. My prayers calm storms. My words give life. My hands bring healing. My feet deliver the good news that Christ is risen and that he is coming again. God's word is a lamp directing my steps. His spirit is my power. When I am weak, he makes me strong. Because Christ is coming, I will not back down. I will not sell out or be pushed around. My life is too valuable. My calling is too great. And my God is too good to waste my things on things that do not matter. I am empowered by God's spirit, trained by his word, and tried by his fire. My name is written in his book. My life belongs to him because my life is not my own and I am a citizen of heaven. I will live for the glory of God, not the applause of people. I am strong in the Lord and in his mighty power and I will do his will on earth as it is in heaven because Christ lives in me, trials will not stop me. People cannot break me. Money cannot buy me. Haters cannot silence me. And demons cannot defeat me. My friends, the time is short. The days are evil and our king is coming soon. And because eternity matters, I will give him my everything. No regrets, no excuses, nothing holding anything back. With his help and by his power, I will leave no words unsaid, no deeds undone, and no hope unshared because my king is coming again. Would you stand with me, please? If you're here today and you're not a follower of Christ, but the Lord has spoken to you today through his word, and you want to give your life to him, and you want to confess that he is your Lord and he is your Savior, I want to lead you in a prayer right now. There's no magic in these words, but if you pray this out of the uh, sincerity of your heart, God will hear you, and he will save you, and you will be born again. Your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. Would you say this with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I repent for being master of my own life and living separate from you. 
I turn away from my sin. And I turn wholeheartedly toward you. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. Today I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. I welcome you, Holy Spirit, into my life to rescue and empower me and to restore me to intimacy with my Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, friends, I want to encourage you. Make church priority for you. Join a life group. Attend the growth track. Get baptized. Let us know all those things on the connection card. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the power of your word. We thank you, Lord, that you will ride again. We thank you, Lord, for what you did the first time you rode. You entered into Jerusalem triumphant as a king. And you made your way to the cross. You were beaten, bruised, you suffered, mocked. And you laid down your life for us. You paid it all. And then you rose again on the third day. Father, we thank you for the future hope that is very, very certain that you are coming again. And I pray today over all of us, my brothers, my sisters, everyone who's watching on YouTube, Father, that you would strengthen us Lord, that you would make us strong and mighty in your power. Lord, that we might be people who know how to pray. And we might be people committed to one another. And that we might be people who are committed to make a difference in these last days. So strengthen us, we pray. Make us strong in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Can we give the Lord praise for a wonderful day? (laughs) Hallelujah, God. We love you, Lord. We praise your holy name, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.